picked up or can you all hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So I don't know what happened to William. Hopefully he'll be able to join us. Um, and I can go ahead and get the introduction started at the very least so that we can get this party started. We're streaming live on Facebook. Hopefully William uh, gets his internet back or whatever and can come back on and join us. So uh, welcome everybody for our, what is our 10th candidate forum in the 2022 election cycle. Uh, we It looks like we're gonna have a total of 11. Uh, next week, we have Mesa Public School Board candidates joining us. And uh, tonight we have Tucson Unified School Board candidates who are joining us. So for those of you, who maybe this is your first event or you don't know us very well, Secular AZ is a 501c3 organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state in Arizona for over a decade. And I am excited to be hosting our 10th in a series of candidate forums for school board candidates in Arizona. We decided to start hosting this type. Oh, good, you're back. So glad. Uh, we decided to begin start, uh, hosting this type of event because our members care about the growing threat of white Christian nationalism in our state and in our country. And we're seeing how this political ideology is threatening our local school boards. And our local school boards truly are the heart of our democracy. So like I said, there might be some newcomers here. And if our mission is something that you care deeply about, we ask you to consider becoming a member of our organization, perhaps even becoming a monthly donor or volunteering for our various events or on our committees, um, or you can do all three. So uh, we also have a process where we can guide you uh, through the request to speak process. It's an app used by the legislature. Uh, and that way you can engage with your elected officials at the Arizona legislature when you sign up for our action alert. So I encourage you to uh, go to secularaz.org, learn more about us and uh, discover some of the opportunities that we provide. And again, we are a 501c3 and we uh, are a small but mighty organization that definitely relies on the generosity of uh, our members and of our donors. So tonight, as I said, we're going to be speaking with candidates for the Tucson Unified School District Governing Board. Uh, and according to public records, there are six candidates who are running for two seats. and. I, I, I want to make sure there's no two-year seat in this race, correct? Candidates? No. Okay. So there are six candidates running for two four-year seats. Uh, we have three of them here with us tonight. Uh, uh, we did not receive a response from Jennifer Ekstrom. Uh, I hope I'm saying her name right. We did receive a response from Val Romero who um, explained the constitution to us uh, and, and, and respectfully declined our invitation. Uh, uh, we did not receive a response from Luis Gonzalez, but tonight we do have three other candidates. I'm going to put them in alphabetical order right now because that's how we're going to do the questions as well. So tonight we have Brianna Chilius. Did I say it right, Brianna? Okay. So we have Brianna Chilius, and we have uh, William or Will Solon, and I said that right. <laughs> and then we also have Rebecca uh, Zapian. So I'm so glad that all of you have stepped up to run for your local school board. As I said earlier, uh, it, it was one of my greatest joys, uh, one of my favorite experiences of public service to be on my local public school board. And it really, really is the heart of our democracy. So. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and get this party started. Like I said, we're going to allow candidates to introduce themselves with a three minute limit in alphabetical order. Then we'll ask questions with the second person in alphabetical order and so on. And please, I've been known to kind of get the order mixed up sometimes. So if I get it wrong, feel free to let me know. I'll let our candidates know when they have a 10 second limit. Eric will uh, alert me to when they're getting close to time. And uh, let's just go ahead and get started. After that, we'll have closing statements and audience questions. You can go ahead and throw those into the Q&A. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with Brianna. Go ahead and introduce yourself to the attendees and to our members. Oh. I see your message, Eric. Uh, I would be, that's very strange because I sent 
wonder if I got the email wrong, but if Jennifer is here and if Jennifer would like to uh, join us, by all means, we could turn her into a panelist. So if you want to communicate that with Jennifer, that would be great. And I'm going to now check my uh, <laughs> my email to make sure that I got it right. But as far as I can see, I have an email. So perhaps it was my, maybe I typed it wrong. But by all means, Jennifer, if you would like to join us, you absolutely can. All right. So let's go ahead because it would still be Brianna who's going first. So Brianna, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Janine, for introducing me and just inviting me to be able to participate for tonight's discussion forum and to just be a panelist and just to get to know the attendees and who's watching and who's really a member uh, of this awesome uh, organization. So my name is Brianna Chilius. I like to go by like Brie, like the baking cheese. And so I'm a children's librarian over at the Quincy Douglas Library within the Pima County Public Library System in Southern Arizona. The reason why I wanted to run personally is because as a former TUSD school elementary librarian, I saw a lot of things that could use a lot more advocacy and voice to what could improve upon services within the existing library programming and TUSD across the board. Uh, amongst other things, of course. And so I'm just really happy to be here and just show my face and just to really get to know our attendees and other community members involved. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Brianna. And I will see if we can open this up to um, Jennifer. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and William, go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience. inviting us here tonight. Um, I'm very interested in your organization and, and the good work that it does. I'm kind of amused that uh, Mr. Romero felt it necessary to explain the Constitution to you all. Um, anyway, my name is William R. Solon. I'm a public defender. Uh, I'm a father. Uh, I have two daughters. Um, my eldest is in Sam Hughes. She's in first grade. Uh, and uh, I'm also a, a big geek. And as a geek, I've always loved learning. And um, so growing up in Arizona, uh, I grew up in Phoenix, I always felt like public education was being cut even as early as the 1980s and the 1990s. And I've always thought that teachers were working really hard uh, for their students and that it wasn't fair the way things got cut and cut and cut. Um, so one of the reasons I'm running is to support public education and to make sure that even though the, the legislature seems spent on funneling as much money away from public schools as possible, that uh, as the money that does get to our public schools goes to the right places, to the teachers, to the classroom. Um, the second big thing that is an issue for me as, as a public defender is the school to prison pipeline. Um, I see every day at my job uh, people who you know, if somebody had had been supportive of them at the right time in their life, um, they might have gone down a different path. And I think that when we look at the way our schools are right now, um, you know, they've been trying to do so much security. And I, I agree that our, our kids need safety. I agree that school shootings are a terrible thing. Um, but turning schools into sort of, you know, lockdown facilities with armed guards is scary to me. And I think it makes a lot of children nervous. Um, so I, I, I want to fight for our kids. I want to make people feel safe. And then my final, um, you know, major platform plank is just protecting, you know, our most vulnerable students, uh, our LGBTQIA students, our BIPOC students. Um, you know, this summer was a really scary summer with the U.S. Supreme Court, the decision in jo Dobbs and the decision in, um, I'm blanking on the name of the case, the 50 yard line case. Um, you know, it really looks like the Supreme Court is gunning for a lot of rights that we've taken for granted. And I want to make sure um, that we're protecting our kids. I don't want to see a teenager who happens to get pregnant, um, you know, sent into this, the prison system uh, because somebody at school tattled on her because she got an abortion. Uh, I don't want to see um, you know, some of our, our trans students, you know, we're seeing across the nation, um, trans kids are being discriminated against by school boards. 
I want to protect those kids. Um, so that's why I'm here. That's what I'm here to fight for. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, one of my uh, mentors, uh, Dr. Don Kobe, who used to be the Maricopa County School Superintendent, that was probably the best piece of advice he ever gave me was to uh, lead with our most vulnerable students in mind. So thank you for that sentiment. Um, again, if Jennifer, I know that you're on the Facebook chat, and if you'd like to join us, I uh, would, we would love to have you. I'm not really sure where the miscommunication lies, um, but I, I do feel like uh, we, uh, we'd love to have you join us and we can figure out a way to maybe rectify this in some way. So uh, let's go ahead now and go to Rebecca. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Talk about why you decided to run for the board. Hi, my name is Rebecca Sepien. Um, I'm a parent. I'm a third generation teacher. Um, I'm actually a USD alum. And um, currently, I work to help prepare early childhood teacher educators at the University of Arizona. Um, that is people who want to work with kids first through third grade. Um, I decided to run for the school board because I intimately work with teachers, students, and families, um, as well as incoming teachers on a daily basis. So I kind of live and breathe schools. Um, I work with and partner with all, a lot of the major school districts in Tucson, uh, with TUSC big, being the biggest. Um, I interact with them the most. And I think that TUSD has a lot of history um, of uh, things that they do well and don't often get to celebrate or hold or model and grow because of the constant turmoil and attack on public education in the state of Arizona. Um, so I'd like to see TUSD be able to do more for its teachers, do more for the community it serves. Um, actually for the entire uh, workforce within TUSC because we all come in contact with kids, not just certified teachers. Um, so I've been asked to run before and I never have because I shied away from uh, the political world. I've always been on the side of organizing. I've always been on the side of volunteering for other candidates. And I decided because this is something that I do all the time and I'm able to do well, meaning navigate policy, navigate TUSD and know it um, so intimately that this was the time. I think both uh, Brianna and Will touched on a lot of the things that bring me to the table as far as the school to prison pipeline, the um, systemically um, oppressed nature of public schooling by under-resourcing purposely, um, libraries, school nursing, um, substitutes, bus drivers, all of those things. It's like the perfect storm. And I think with um, the current political scope, particularly in Arizona with the voucher expansion, um, the threat to really um, limit what curriculum we can teach, um, the attack on trans athletes, on uh, indigenous and uh, indigenous languages, histories, all of those things um, really are at the center of who TUSD is. And I'd like to see a board that uh, pushes back and organizes to create something different for the population that lives in Tucson. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. Um, so as a school board member, because we went in alphabetical order the, for the introductions with Brianna going first, we are going to go to uh, Will this time around. And the question for you, Will, is what programming and policies do you hope to bring to the district? I'm going to be pushing forward. Uh, I call it, for lack of a better term, the no tattling policy. Um, like I said in my introduction, I want to make sure that uh, any child who comes to school pregnant one week and not pregnant the next week isn't uh, reported to law enforcement. Um, and there's already a similar policy in place right now at TUSD for um, uh, immigration issues. 
TUSD employees uh, are not allowed to report to law enforcement on issues of students' immigration status. And I think the same thing should be true for reproductive health. Um, and you know, we may need to expand that as well to issues relating to gender identity um, and uh, to orientation. <clears throat> Because the, the, the more these attacks on people's personal lives go on, um, you know, the, the more we're going to need to protect our students. I think that, um, you know, a lot of people make fun of the idea of a safe space, but a school should be a safe space for a student to learn who they are uh, and to learn about the world. And so that's one of the major platforms that I would be pushing. A second major policy of mine, um, you know, related again to the school to prison pipeline issue is that this summer the board just voted to add uh, more SSOs uh, to our campuses. Um, SSOs are school security officers. In theory, they're different than school resource officers who are our police officers, but there's, there's still authority figures with, with uh, weapons and with badges. Um, and as I said earlier, I, I think that that tends to make some portions of the population feel uncomfortable and feel unsafe. And the major excuse for putting uh, these officers in our schools has been to stop school shootings. But we've seen with recent school shootings, there were SROs on those campuses. There were police on those campuses and it didn't stop the school shooting. I think that sometimes if a student has reached the point that they're gonna take such drastic action, having uh, an antagonist is almost a positive for them. Um, so what I would be pushing forward is fewer police officers and more counselors, more social workers. I think we need to make sure that children are feeling supported and we should be catching people before they hit the point where they feel like violence is their only recourse. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I, I, this, I just want to let everybody know, Jennifer uh, did not know about this because I messed up on the email. And so I don't want this to be in any way, shape or form a reflection on her candidacy or her character. Uh, I, I deeply regret the fact that I, I made a mistake. Um, it is not the first time uh, operator errors. So Jennifer, please accept my sincere apologies. You seem like a fabulous candidate. I'm looking at you on Facebook right now. And so this was this, I own this, okay? Um, and hopefully we can make it up to you in some way. Perhaps we can have a discussion where you can share your platform with folks because I'm sure that had you known about it, you would have been able to rearrange your schedule so that you could get it done. So please uh, accept my apologies, everybody. Um, human error. I made a mistake. So that said, uh, Will went first that time. We're going to have Rebecca go uh, next, and it's going to be the same question. So what kind of programming or and or policies would you like to bring to the Tucson Unified School District? Um, I have a really long list, so I'm trying to sort through the, the things that are, are at the top. And uh, we'll hit on a bunch of things that are sort of urgent items that I have as well. And I also want to um, focus on the issue of teacher shortage and retention is at the top of my list, because um, I do think that a lot of the things that we talk about when we talk about who is teaching our kids, uh, issues of inequity. We need kids to be taught by people who they know from their communities that reflect them. Um, that includes uh, not just language, but also queer teachers, all the things. I think that when we talk about uh, creating a grow your own model within uh, any programming, but in this case in TUSD, I think investing in our students in a way that um, want them to come into teaching in meaningful ways. You know, there's some programming that the that Governor Ducey has put in, in place for uh, things like basic tuition being covered for teachers um, or people who are going to school to become teachers. And that's just such a like small drop in the bucket of what requires uh, uh, to create a teacher, you know, coming into low paying jobs um, doesn't solve the issue of keeping people, the amount of stress that they're under. So I think 
really focusing on resourcing teachers who are in the workforce already in ways that they feel more supportive and want to say, stay, excuse me, um, as well as looking at people who work within the schools and work with kids. So non-certified staff like teaching assistants who would like to pursue degrees. That's a great model of making college more accessible to people who want it, who are from within the university. I'm sorry, uh, Tucson community. And um, I think TUSC could do really well with something like that. Um, so that's one really big uh, thing that I think about often because it, we graduate the same number of teachers for for the last 10 years, they're just not staying. And so just covering their tuition is not enough. We need to give them a reason to stay. We need to give people a reason to come into the profession. And all of these laws that are incredibly restrictive and threatening to people's safety and well being, like the reporting laws that Will talked about, or think old things like SB 1070, um, really create a pressure situation for teachers. Um, another thing that I've been doing a lot of focusing on is actually also um, looking at uh, things like standardized testing. Um, you know, we spend an incredible amount of money on standardized testing, which doesn't support teachers, nor does it support kids and youth to be competent and capable people in this world. And I think what it does is it feeds into all these other things like the school to prison pipeline, like capitalism in a way that doesn't serve people. Um, it's essentially about creating uh, low paid workers. Um, so looking at the amount of resources that we're putting into standardized testing, taking away some of the expectations put on teachers in order to do it, um, and really focusing on learning and looking at our students as whole competent people in, in schools. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so that means we are going to go to Brianna next. Same question for you. What kind of programming and policies would you like to bring to the Tucson Unified School District? Thank you, Janine. I want to really acknowledge that my fellow panelists, they really touched on a lot of key components, a lot of key things that, that would make our district a lot better, a lot more enriching, a lot more fruitful, a lot more beneficial for our students and teachers and staff within the district. Me coming from the realm of librarianship, I must speak on it, and this is going to sound very cliche, but I promise you this is in line in tandem with the other things that I would like to voice, amplify, and bring to the conversation um, as a contributing voice to um, conversations around things that will have a direct impact as well as an in indirect impact on our students and teachers and staff, our book challenges. So we, so we saw this uh, recently in a form, um, not so much as a book challenge or just a book banning or rather, but just how we are kind of in this age where we're seeing that now more than ever. Um, I think it's kind of ironic that we have uh, this growing constituency that's like really concerned about what books or what materials, what culturally relevant materials should be taught to be used as tools to help teach our children ways of interconnectedness with empathy for each other and understanding and having an expansive mind to really learn about other cultures, other people from backgrounds. Uh, it's not a challenge. It's not um, really anything too, too, too outrageous, but I find it very ironic that we live in a very rich, beautifully diverse community. And there are people who are against books that reflect the beauty of the, the, the rich diversity uh, that we see and we work with and we interact with and we're trying to uphold and really uh, cherish within our, um, within our, our district. So uh, just really just uh, implementing a challenge, a book challenging policy. Thank you so much for that, Brianna. Uh, okay, so let me go to the next question. And this time it is going to be Rebecca who goes first. Um, and, you know, uh, thinking about that, 
you know, I would like to, and by the way, for people who are in the webinar or people who are on Facebook, by all means, if you have a question, please go ahead and share that question. Um, let's go ahead and go to this question because I kind of feel like it fits in with uh, with Brianna's answer. Uh, so uh, what is your stance on uh, the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion programming in the Tucson Unified School District. Uh, do you support programming that includes diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in the Tucson Unified School District? And again, we're going to go with Rebecca first this time. So Rebecca, take it away. Um, absolutely, 100%. I'd actually like to see more of it, especially as the DSEG order closes. Um, you know, uh, TUSD has had a really long history with the DSEG order um, and also the history that it has with Tom Horn uh, dismantling the Mexican American Studies program. I absolutely support programming. Um, I would love to see something like Mexican American Studies be brought back in a more uh, thorough way throughout the district, as well as Indigenous teachers to be brought in to um, talk, talk, teach culturally relevant um, in every content area. So uh, one of the things that um, I think would be moving forward with the board that would be great is actually looking at the DSEG order and putting that into all aspects of what the board is doing. The board should constantly be looking at issues of equity, to constantly re-examining its policies. You know, Will touched on the SRO, SSO. That is something that we deeply, deeply see uh, in particular in uh, schools with a large BIPOC community, much more so than in affluent areas, which is incredibly damaging. That's a big piece of this. Um, I think that the board's work is to constantly be looking at this and leading with those things in mind in every aspect of the board from where what curriculum, what books, what math, um, who they hire, how they invest, um, lunch policies, all of the things. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. So the same question now will go to Brianna. What is your stance on, um, or do you support diversity, equity, and inclusion training in uh, Tucson Unified School District? Absolutely. I'm smiling because um, as a BIPOC person, I fully support it. We have to acknowledge the world that we're living in. Okay. We have to acknowledge the reality of the world that we're living in. Otherwise, we're doing a disservice to our audiences who we serve, in this case, teachers, staff, and students who are a reflection of that community. So my fellow panelists, Ms. Zapian had touched upon, and also Mr. Solon had touched upon the presence of, let's just call a spade a spade, a police in schools. Why is that? That connects to a really deeply rooted issue. And we have to look at it comparatively of why that is. Why are there, why is there police presence within schools attended by students that are historically underrepresented, historically met, uh, marginalized and disenfranchised versus say, for example, uh, the Tan Tanque Verde School District, uh, they're very affluent, they're very well off. They don't have much so more or less police presence present within their district. Why is that? So I think when we examine certain issues, I personally think we need to really critically assess, evaluate and maybe provide addendums or give a closer examination to existing standing policies that are in place with a more anti-racist lens, because that is really covered within DEI training. That is something that I am proud to say that we are doing uh, within my line of work, especially within children's services, uh, live birth to eight, uh, and also working with young adults, especially within, specifically within those, within that category, BIPOC and LGBTQ, they are at the intersection of what, what they receive uh, as far as penal punishment for just uh, the, the, the circumstances of their, uh, of their existence. 
So I feel as though, yes, I'm fully in supportive of it and we need to adopt these and really critically look at it in a way with an anti-racist lens with the work that we're doing. Fantastic. Um, Y'all are impressive, I just gotta say that. Uh, this is a really great discussion so far. Uh, so let's go ahead then and we are going to finish off this question with Will. So do you support uh, DEI programming for Tucson Unified School District? Absolutely, I do. Um, you know, I, I, as the only cisgender white male on the panel tonight uh, who's, who's running, uh, I should acknowledge that I'm gonna be speaking from a place of privilege. Um, but I know that the DSEG order has been highly controversial, that it's been a big pain for a lot of people in Tucson for a lot of years. Um, but I think about my experience going to high school. Uh, we had a magnet program. That's how T uh, Phoenix Union High School District decided they were going to deal with the issue of desegregation. And the way it worked is you would bus in groups of kids um, who lived in a different neighborhood. Well, the school I ended up going to lived in a, was in a predominantly, um, you know, Chicano neighborhood, and they were wanting to bus kids in from outside of that neighborhood. So what that meant was they were looking specifically to bus white people into that school. And the program that they had there was the International Baccalaureate Program. It's an extremely advanced educational program. So you're busing in a bunch of white students who pass these really high uh, tests. And it creates this almost little click within the school. So you've got all the white students taking classes together, and then all the black and brown students are taking different classes. And it just felt very elitist growing up. I look around my daughter's first grade classroom, and I see a cross section of Tucson. And that's very important to me. And I think that the more we can teach um, you know, diversity and inclusion in our schools, starting with kindergarten or even pre-K up, the more uh, good that we can do. Um, you know, I uh, read a lot growing up. Um, you know, Brianna is a um, librarian. My parents were both librarians. They met in library science school. My wife uh, went to library science school. And I think that representation in the books we read is very important to a child's education. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's see, let's go to uh, another question that may be kind of related. I mean, these are things in my opinion that don't that shouldn't be uh, controversial, but these days it seems that everything is controversial. So uh, the next question that I have for you, and we are going to start with Brianna again this time. Right, did I get that right? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, the next question I have is, do you support programming that includes comprehensive sex ed, uh, otherwise known as CSE, uh, for the Tucson Unified School District? So Brianna, you're gonna go ahead and go first there. Give us your thoughts. Personally, I do. Uh, here's why. I, um, I'm gonna speak from experience from my secondary uh, education, attending school with peers uh, who learned too late or who learned unfortunate ways of sex education. I've learned that uh, certain issues such as race and sex, they're not really taught, or even religion, they're not taught in school. I found that that is a, that is a detriment, a detrimental impact when kids of a certain age go out into the real world, when they are exploring. That is a critical time, and I'm speaking developmentally within child development and like within uh, teens and tween tweens and teenagers, they are still exploring. They need guidances, they need guides, as well as people who can be there to be a resource, as well as possibly a curriculum. I am fully unsupportive. I went to school with peers who did not learn uh, the ramifications or the consequences of, of not learning or properly engaging or learning just the are basically equipping them the, the, the necessary knowledge around sexual education. It's this taboo thing that is not often talked about. And I feel like when our concerned community members, when they do this, shy away or not talk about it or even expose children to necessary resources that can help them within their development as well as exploring their identities, sexual orientation within their gender identities, and all of the, all of the things that's interconnected within that realm, within development, 
they will suffer the consequences if they're not taught the things that they need to learn. Um, I'm checking out a book right now and I'm recommending certain books for my kids, uh, the students that I work with, just uh, books about within, especially LGBTQ, trans and um, just survival guides. These are resources that are not exposed to teenagers or kids within their, within their journey of becoming more uh, contributing, civic-minded, knowledgeable adults in their future. If we don't provide them that access, it's going to be damaging effects in the long term. Thank you so much, Brianna. I love the fact, too, that you're showing, I mean, like in true librarian fashion, you're showing us the books that uh, you would be recommending to kids. I still remember my uh, elementary school librarian, Mrs. Dickerson, and she was instrumental in helping me find books that helped me kind of discover who I was and to develop that kind of compassion and empathy that literature can teach us, right? So thank you for that. Uh, let's go ahead now and we're going to go to Will. You're next. Same question. Comprehensive sex ed in Tucson Unified. What's your stance? Uh, Will? Okay, now I can hear you. Sorry. You can you hear me now? Okay. I, I was saying I'm 100% in favor of comprehensive sex education. I think it's absolutely essential at this juncture. Um, I think with the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision, kids need to know now more than ever what the consequences of sexual activity is going to be. In terms of the comprehensive nature, I think that we can start teaching kids about the concept of consent and about autonomy over their own bodies as early as preschool or kindergarten. Uh, I think it's very important. To me, comprehensive sex ed also means, um, you know, as, as Ms. Chilvis was saying, uh, you know, it, it also means exposing kids to different ways of being a family. Um, you know, I remember growing up and reading a lot of books where the family basically looked like Leave it to Beaver. Um, and that's not how families look. Uh, you know, I have some very close friends um, who are raising a wonderful family. Um, two moms and kids should see examples of that or two dads or all sorts of other kind of family groups. They should see people of all colors in their books. Um, and I think it's very important um, right now to, to make sure that kids know about things like that. Um, you know, when I went to school, I can remember in my sex ed classes, they used to separate the kids. I don't know if they still do that, but I can remember the male sex ed teacher that I had in, uh, it would have been sixth grade, um, encouraging the boys to do some things that I think he would not have talked about if it had been a mixed gender classroom. Um, it was thoroughly inappropriate. Uh, and I, I think we need to have good sex ed. Kid, kids need to be prepared. Great, thank you so much. And that means Rebecca, you're gonna close us out with that question. Comprehensive sex ed in Tucson Unified, what's your stance? Uh, I absolutely support it. And I think it can start at preschool and older. Consent is a huge part of what this curriculum can include. And uh, that is a huge part of uh, this process. I don't think that comprehensive sex ed has to be only with um, the repercussions of what happens to us if we don't have the information. I do think that's a big part of it. And also, I think my bigger concern is what happens in the way that it's currently structured. So we're not talking about things like consent. We're not talking about body autonomy. And what that ends up doing is it ends up erasing a huge portion of the population. So these practices like separating people based on their uh, assigned uh, sex at birth doesn't normalize anything. It also just purely erases kids for who they are in lots of different ways. Um, I think it's actually something that uh, TUSD could do better. I'd love to see this look differently. I'd love to see a model that is age appropriate. There's all sorts of checks and balances that are already in place for people who might want to do something differently. We have all sorts of policies to opt in and out of things. You have to opt in for this, but you have to opt out to talk to a military recruiter. It doesn't make sense. It's not acknowledging who kids are. It's not serving them. And it's not responsible to our larger community. 
Thank you so much. I tell you what, the people in Tucson Unified have some tough decisions to make coming up in uh, November. Uh, you all are really fantastic. Uh, so let's see, this is one of my favorites and I kind of have a feeling how <laughs> most of you are going to answer this. Uh, and we're going to start this time with uh, Will. Uh, and especially given your introduction, Will, I'd love to know what approach should schools and districts have with regards to student discipline? A uh, discipline model. I think that um, that would be the most effective way to go forward. You know, there's always going to be some kids who are really acting out and actually deserve some kind of severe punishment. But for the most part, in my line of work, I feel like I'm learning that punishment really doesn't work. Um, it, it should be a last resort. Uh, people mostly come out of a punishment system bitter. Um, but my understanding of restorative justice and restorative discipline is that you would involve the transgressor in the, um, in, in the decisions moving forward. And it reminds me of when I worked uh, in Flagstaff, I worked for DNA People's Legal Services. And I, um, as part of that, I did a lot of work on the Navajo reservation. I'm honored to be a member of the Navajo Nation Bar and active. Uh, and when you pass the Navajo Nation Bar, if you're not a tribal member, which I'm not, uh, you have to take a culture and tradition course. It's a week long. You can't learn all of Navajo culture and tradition in a week. Um, but one thing that we did learn about was what was called peacemaker court. Uh, and that's very similar to this restorative justice idea. You get everyone who's involved, um, who's, who's really concerned in an issue together, and everyone talks until they make a consensus. And if they can't come to a consensus, it can go to a more formal courtroom proceeding. So you could go to a more formal discipline after you try uh, restorative justice first. But I, I think that expulsions should be a last resort. I think suspensions should be a last resort. Um, I think we need to try a lot of other things before we go there, because again, it's primarily BIPOC kids, disabled kids who are getting the brunt of these uh, heavy disciplinary actions. They're the ones getting the police called on them and it takes them out of the school system. And when they're taken out of the school system, that's when they end up in the political, uh, the criminal justice system. And that's when they become my problem at my day job. And that's what I don't want to see. Great, thank you so much, Will, for that answer. Uh, so the same question is going to go to you, Rebecca. Uh, uh, how, let's see, what approach should schools and districts have with regards to school discipline? I, I have a similar answer as well. I do think that uh, restorative or transformative justice models are really great. Um, and they actually belong in schools, but we don't, uh, need in schools is a punitive system that further feeds the school to prison pipeline. And that's what we actually have in place. Um, the wonderful thing about modern technology and being so plugged in, uh, in these various ways, uh, with like the internet and so on, we know that there's a lot of school districts who have moved away from extremely punitive, uh, measures. And like Will said, and many of us know that the people who it impacts the more the most are people who are purposefully systemically oppressed and these kinds of models do nothing to serve our communities so i would love for tusd to take this into the fold as part of their like diversity equity equity and inclusion work because it's a big part of it and you can't separate the two and i think too um one of the things that I would be curious about is um, how um, hard that is to do. We're seeing it uh, since the uprisings during the pandemic, we're seeing more and more districts doing it. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's something that serves everybody who's at the table from teachers, um, all the staff, obviously the youth and children and the family it serves. Are we here to really uh, work in collaboration with our community, then if the answer is yes, then this is a huge part of it. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Brianna, same question goes to you. Uh, and that question is, what approach should schools and districts have with regards to student discipline? My fellow panelists, Ms. Avian and Mr. Solon, 
already pretty much already touched upon what I'm going to say in my response. I really think there should be um, critical lens, more anti-racist in tandem with restorative justice practice. I feel as though if we could buff up or enrich that, that model, we would be seeing certain kids being funneled within the school to prison pipeline. So we need to acknowledge where this particular pipeline exists and who is being impacted. Most, so I'm gonna just bring a really quick, uh, quick qualitative statistical uh, fact. Uh, there's this book called Push, the, the, the criminalization of black, of black girls in schools. So the, it pretty much talks about expulsion, suspension, detentions, and how there are no preventative barriers of actually keeping kids in, finding and utilizing really heavily the restorative justice practices to keep the kids in school. I would love, and it's not that TOC isn't doing it, I don't think it's not doing enough to really have th that particular model or, or infuse those restorative justice practices in place to have those preventative measures in place to prevent our kids, black and brown kids being funneled into the school of prison pipeline. It is a very real thing. So we need to really critically look at and also probably assess what is being done, what has worked, what has not worked, move forward in assessing the ways in which we can really work with students instead of just equating them or writing them off and being dismissive and saying that they are a problem, they cannot be held punishing them with punitive just with punitive punishment, being expelled, being exposed, exposed, expo, expelled, excuse me, because that will impact their futures. Those are our futures that we're affecting if we just quickly write them off, especially the odds against BIPOC students. So I am for restorative justice practice models in the district. Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm a big fan of restorative practices. I, I did restorative circles in my own classroom, and it's uh, it's an amazing tool when you can build that kind of trust and community in your classroom to, you know, allow students to kind of take that talking piece and and share their concerns with other students. Thank you so much for your very thoughtful answers. I went ahead and also put the uh, push out film. Uh, I, I, I just saw the film thing come up first, so I put that in our Facebook chat for people who want to see that. I'll make sure I put it in the webinar chat as well, because it looks like a, a great opportunity for us to learn more. Um, all right, let's move on to another question. Um, so this one has been coming up, obviously, well, uh, especially since the events that happened in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, what do you think, and this time we're going to go with Rebecca first, uh, but what do you think needs to be done with regards to stopping school shootings? And so it's kind of a two-part question. And what role can school boards play to keep kids and staff safe? So first part of the question, you know, what do you think needs to be done? This is more at a macro level, right? And then what, as a school board member, what, if you, if you were to get under the school board, what role uh, should school boards be playing uh, in order to keep kids and staff safe? And if we go just a tad bit on time, because this is a two-parter, Eric, we'll, we'll be kind, we'll be forgiving. So um, Rebecca, go ahead and take that question for us. Um, I listened to this question and the Marana, and I was so, um, impressed with um, what the two candidates were talking about it. And I've, I've taken this one out a lot since watching and listening to them. And to be honest, I feel like this is one of those situations where burdens are being put on school districts to carry out a huge societal problem. Um, so what we do know is that the ways that we've gone about trying to address um, school shootings um, aren't working and they're actually really harmful to our youth and kids. So things like lockdown drills, um, further uh, arming and increasing police presence on schools, all of those things are uh, extremely harmful. And I don't think that they serve us in preventing any of these things. What they do is they actually tax our public schools more. Um, 
So I really look at the greater community to help facilitate some of those answers. I don't think that Javier policing is ever the answer to anything, um, especially in a school like Tucson, uh, excuse me, in a, in a city like Tucson. Um, <clears throat> so I, I am open to learning more about what other options there are that have worked that don't look like this, because what I know is that um, it's easy to rely on systems that are familiar to us. So for, for an example of that, that would be police for us. Um, and what we also know is that it doesn't serve us. So we need to think broader and bigger and we do not as districts need to take on the cost and the mental taxing that it takes on the communities that we're serving. Great, thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you, Eric, for doing that. Uh, he went ahead and shared the film. Uh, next is going to be Brianna. So Brianna, uh, let me let me say that again, because again, it's two-parter, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, given the recent events in Uvalde, Texas, what do you think needs to be done with regards to stopping school shootings? So that's part one. And what role can school boards play to keep kids and staff safe? For the first part of your question, I really think it's really important. This is why I'm going to be such a huge advocate for mental health specialists, school counselors, and school psychologists of being present in the school more so than police, police presence in schools, because they have more of an intimate interaction uh, if they're not too busy restraining the student, unfortunately, uh, if if that was remedied in a way where it takes, a, it, it takes that attention away there would be more of a health, mental health wellness. There would be, I would, I would love if elected to maybe create a policy or a program where there will be mental health specialists on site present to talk and check in with students, particularly high school. There's a lot that our kids are going through around that, you know, a certain point in their lives. So I feel as though, and I agree with my fellow panelists, Ms. Uh, Zappian, that I don't think policing will is ever the answer. And speaking as a Black American, a Black person here in America, I can tell you that heavy policing and ha having heavy police presence in certain communities, it's not going to remedy the situation, especially when you're in constant interactions or contact with BIPOC communities. The second uh, part of your question is that I feel as though being a part of a governing entity like the school board governing school governing board, that's a powerful platform. I feel as though in my personal opinion that the school governing board is a powerful liaison between the community voices that are expressing their grievances of like what's going on when they're within their community versus, or excuse me, between the state legislators, the lawmakers, the policy makers, they could voice, they could, the, 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 the board members of this governing entity can voice their concerns. They could take it to, they could take their issues up with the people who oversee certain policies and issues and laws that are being passed and made. They have a powerful presence in that. So I think it's really important now more than ever that school boards really listen to their, their community voices. They are the biggest amplifiers when it comes to highlighting the deficits and the, the, the deficiencies of like what is lacking, what's under what's under resourced, under under severely under resourced, and what resources can be provided to help remedy situations. Uh, there's no clear cut way to actually stop the school shootings. However, if there are strategic ways, strategies that we can really talk about implementing, uh, my idea would be actually having more health counselors, mental health specialists on site more so than, uh, well, I'm just gonna call it for what it is, police presence on, in schools. <laughs> um, I feel that would be a huge deterrent of having that particular action affect the masses, uh, one life affecting all lives. So that's what I'm in support of. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, so Will, you're last on this question. Uh, same question goes to you, so it's two-parter. Um, what uh, you know? What what needs to be done with regards to stopping school shootings at the, at the macro level? And then, what role can school boards play to keep kids and staff safe? Thank you. Um, and and once again, I'm you know generally in agreement with uh, Ms. Zapian and Ms. Chilius, and we do need to reduce 
a reliance on uh, school safety officers, SROs, police in schools. Um, it does nothing to prevent school shootings so far as I can tell. And it does make our BIPOC kids feel uncomfortable. If you're looking at the TV every night and you're seeing about things like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, and then you go to school and you see an armed officer, uh, how are you gonna study wondering if this is the day that your cell phone gets mistaken for a gun? It's, it's not gonna work out. Um, past that, what um, Ms. Chilius said about counselors, you know, psychologists, social workers, that's a big part of it too. Um, these school shootings don't just happen in a vacuum. It, it, kids have to plan them. Kids have to build up a bunch of resentment. And I'm saying kids, but I, I strongly believe that this is an issue with toxic masculinity. Um, and that's something that we can do something about at the school board level, at the curriculum level. When we're talking about things like comprehensive sex ed, we can push more wholesome, uh, more holistic, ideas about what it means to be a man. You know, you don't have to go with the Rambo view of what masculinity means to, to be a valid person who happens to be a man. Um, and that's, that's what we're really seeing here is somebody who's been pushed to the edge. They feel somehow they've been wrong and they're committing violence because that's what our society generally says is how guys are supposed to do it. Um, so again, I, I'm totally on board with what the other panelists have said. Uh, we need to, to create a community at our schools that feels safe, that feels protected, and that gives kids a way to grow that isn't violent and isn't toxic. I remember um, a friend of mine, uh, you know, European uh, from France, and they talked about how strange it was for them that you know, sex is edited out, you know, like you may see a kissing scene and then it's fast forward to, you know, two folks lying in bed together, but boy, oh boy, you want to shoot up a whole entire, you know, mall or, or drive cars through things. They were so struck by how different the censorship rules in Europe were, where they kind of protect the children from the violent acts, but, you know, nudity, sex, it's, it's out there because, you know, it's kind of a part of who we are. So this is such an interesting conversation. Again, I feel like the folks in Tucson Unified have some tough decisions to make in November, and I appreciate all of you very much. This is a question that is going to, you know, matter very much to the folks who are members and who are attending today. And that question is, and we're going to go to uh, Brianna first this time. So what role, if any, should religion play in our public schools? Go ahead, Brianna. I found this to be really uh, interesting. I find it that we have we have a division. There are people that are for it. There are people that are not for it. And it's kind of interesting to hear the different views on why and why not, or why should educate, or why should religion should be taught in schools. Um, I'm just going to speak from my personal stance. If it if we exist in a Christian nation and we say the Pledge of Allegiance, I feel like, I feel as though that should be an open door to respect and learn about other religious identities as well. A lot of people probably will not agree with my stance, but I feel as though in order to gain empathy, it's not so much as being fully invested in the religion, in the religious identities of the students or the teachers, but really have an understanding of why it's studied. Why is it important to that particular ethnic group, the ethnicities of the students that are enrolled in schools, in public schools in particularly, um, more so than parochial private schools. I feel as though it gives an opportunity for students to learn empathy, not so much as to be really heavy within the religious studies, there are there are entities, separate entities, such as like places to go to worship, but to learn and to gain knowledge, as well as to gain the empathy and the understanding of that person's religious identity, I feel as though that would be an open door for that. Um, I'm not the biggest religious person uh, myself, <laughs> but if I 
see it as an opportunity for me to learn about someone else's identity, I'm going to take it. Uh, we are living in a very expansive world. There's, there's no time for narrow-mindedness, I'm sorry. There needs to be room for growth and expansiveness. And if we are to be empathetic towards one another, there needs to be opt-in learning opportunities where we can like foster that, that connection with one another, including learning our agenda, religious identity. Great, thank you. Uh, same question is going to go to Will this time. So what role, if any, should religion play in our public schools? The longer answer is that, of course, I, I agree with Ms. Chilius that um, you know, we should be able to learn about all sorts of different cultures and religions in schools. Kids should know that there are a lot of different cultures out there. There are a lot of different belief systems out there. I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, I, I think that's a great thing. I think it's part of diversity. Um, but typically, when we see religion being pushed into the public education sphere, it's a specific religion. Um, you know, I have spent a lot of time, uh, as I said, working on the Navajo reservation. I've never seen a situation where someone was proposing uh, teaching Navajo beliefs in schools. Uh, I have seen a lot of, I've spent a lot of time working on the Pasquayaki reservation. I haven't seen a situation where people are proposing teaching Yaki beliefs in schools. Uh, what I have seen is situations in which people are proposing specifically teaching Christianity. And again, this is uh, the issue with that um, case this summer with the coach playing on the 50 yard line. When a person in authority is leading kids in prayer, that is peer pressure. That is pushing religion onto students in a situation that should be secular. And we have ways for kids to learn their own religion and culture they can go to their own places of worship. They can speak with their own parents and talk to their own religious leaders, or their parents can pay for, pub for private school if that's what they want to do. But public schools should be a way, way that we learn about the entire world and we're not pushing one religion above others on the kids. Great, thank you so much. And now Rebecca, same question goes to you. What role, if any, should religion play in our public schools? Um, I also think that there isn't a role in public schooling. Um, I do think that there is a difference between uh, understanding different religions, different spiritual beliefs, um, and having a foundational opportunity to learn about how uh, religion is practiced in different ways. Uh, I think that's really different than embedding it into our schooling and an expectation, especially since it is often based on Christian belief systems, um, which are never talked about in the ways that they've colonized different parts of the world, um, how they're part of the dominant culture, how they're a big factor in white supremacy. Uh, so they don't really have any place in our public schoolings. Uh, we in Arizona have a ridiculous amount of opportunities to take advantage of vouchers, tax credits. So if you would like those things specifically for your children, there are ways to get that. It is not the responsibility of the public school system to provide that for you. I'm sure uh, just like me, a lot of our uh, members and attendees are, are nodding furiously at all of your answers. So thank you again. Now, uh, this is normally the time where we would go ahead and open it up to our members. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that. We have three questions, uh, but there is one question that I hope that we will possibly have time to get to. I'm gonna go with the first question, question and this one comes from Betts. Uh, Betts says at last night's last night at the board meeting, the district was exposed for having moved ahead with a change to the DAEP program before the board authorized it. So I, I hope Betts, I don't know if you're still there. Yep, she's still there. I don't know if you can clarify or maybe one, you know, probably one of you can clarify what the DAEP program is. So the question again. Uh, last night at the board meeting, the district was exposed for having moved ahead with a change to the DAEP program before the board authorized it. What would your response be to such behavior? Um, 
And again, Bets, if you are around and you want to share what that means, uh, I know that in uh, public education, we are very acronym heavy. And so if you don't know, or if it's uh, you know specific to a district, um, and this time we're gonna actually start with Will. Will, do you know what the what that uh, acronym is stands for? Um, it seems to stand for Disciplinary Alternative Education Programs. Um, I'm gonna have to go ahead and admit that uh, I did not get a chance to watch even virtually uh, last night's board meetings. Um, I had other responsibilities last night that, that took me away from that. Um, and so I, I don't know the exact situation of what happened there. Um, I will say it's highly concerning to me uh, that uh, Dr. Trujillo or whoever it was at the administration would make changes uh, without uh, waiting for board approval. Um, I am personally unclear on what authority uh, the school board would have to enforce uh, anything against Dr. Um, Trujillo. Um, perhaps we should enter into some sort of restorative justice <laughs> um, to deal with uh, the situation, but I, I think it's unacceptable for an administrator to, to go rogue in that way. Um, as a county employee, I know that it was extremely disheartening to me uh, when I found out that uh, Mr. Huckleberry had uh, been double dipping and had retired without announcing to the County Board of Supervisors that he had retired. And he was simultaneously drawing his retirement and a consulting fee. Um, so, you know, administrators need to be held accountable and that's part of our job. I'm not thoroughly familiar with the mechanisms by which we can do that at this time. Excited. Okay. And, and, and Betts did provide a little bit of clarification. She said that the program is basically what the three panelists are talking about when they look for a good way to deal with kids who would otherwise be expelled. So I think that your assessment, uh, Will, was correct on that one. So the same question now is going to go to Rebecca. Uh, uh, they were exposed for having moved ahead with a change to the DAEP program before the board authorized it. And what would your response to such behavior be? Um, well, I think that um, at one, it's highly concerning that anything be done without full transparency and um, essentially uh, decision makers at the table being participants in the process, um, especially with disciplinary measures, um, because ultimately, um, the board and Dr. Trujillo are responsible. Um, so it is harmful to the student that it um, impacted, obviously. It, it has ripple effects outside of that. So I think it's unacceptable. Um, I'm unfamiliar with exactly what happened um, and what the current statues are to um, handle issues of um, this kind of stuff happening from the board to the superintendent and uh, hopefully legal counsel is there to advise them. But truly what this is, is a lack of transparency on the people who have the ability to make decisions. And that is not okay in any way, shape or form. Great, thank you, Rebecca. So uh, Brianna, now the same question is going uh, to you. Uh, they were exposed for having moved ahead with the change to the DAEP program before the board authorized it. What would your response to such behavior be? I was not uh, in attendance for when the board meeting took place yesterday. I also had obligations fulfilled, but I'm just going to say clear cut if it's allowed, I am, not such a huge fan with the actions of the current superintendent. Um, I feel as though decisions and actions should be carefully thought about before moving forward. Um, from my understanding, and I'm not from here, I'm not from Arizona, but um, I've worked with uh, districts before I came to Arizona and learning about this one in particular, uh, there needs to be a thing called transparency 
TUSD has been doing this sort of thing for forever, uh, really actually being communicative and actually being open to letting the constituency know any parties involved within knowing and gaining knowledge of like what's going on in the district uh, to know and be aware of what's what those what those decisions are there needs to be accountability and you know the, the superintendent he is the only board's employee he needs to really act in a way of act, being that employee uh, there are reasons there is a reason why there are people on the board they come together, they, they come together as a collective to make a decision. And so they are doing their best to be fully transparent and being open, as well as listening to the grievances of concerned community members. Certain decisions should not be made without really taking into full consideration, without listening to the community that are involved and invested in learning and going, learning and trying to understand the issues of what's going on. So in my personal opinion, I haven't been a huge fan of what, uh, in respect to Dr. Trujillo, of like just the decisions and actions that have been done. But I feel as though transparency should have been a precedent of just what has been going on. Accountability is also is needed too. Thank you, Brianna. Um, all right, now we are going to start with Rebecca. This one is coming from uh, anonymous attendee for our webinar. And their question is, what experience do you have with school finance and budgets? So uh, again, we'll start with Rebecca. What experience do you have with school finance and budgets? Um, well, I'm part of a really big school. Um, I'm constantly talked to about the budgets, engaging with budgets, how little money we all have, um, how we need to make do with more work and less actual resources. Um, I've been going to the TUSD school board meetings for over a decade. Um, so I'm familiar in lots of different ways that it's impacted from the state's way to fund public education to how the district chooses to spend money. Um, I also work with other districts. So um, I've learned a lot about the process of overrides, voting for overrides, what it means for districts, um, so I, I'm fairly familiar how TUSD does its accounting practices on a day to day. I'm not super intimate with. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so second in line then will be Brianna. Go ahead. Uh, what kind of, um, you know, how, how, how experienced are you with uh, school finance and budgets? On a scale between uh, one to 10, uh, I'm gonna go with zero. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm all about transparency and I'm gonna be honest. I have not actually sat or had sat in front of a school budget or a, you know, a budget that oversees the expenditures or the, the, the budgets for a district or, or just within a school setting. Um, but I'm very familiar with how budgets work. And within that budget, certain things needs to come to a decision on what's going to get cut, what's going to be reassessed and what's going to be reallocated, what funds and what a percentage of those funds are going to be reallocated, uh, what takes priority, what takes precedence. And if there is tight spending, maybe me, maybe pops possibly reassess why a certain percentage of that money is going into this thing instead of having the, to make the very tough decision of why this particular actionable item didn't get funded. Examining the ways of like what takes priority, what gets funding and what doesn't. I will say from a school library experience, cause I was a former library assistant with that at CE Rose, I didn't necessarily, didn't, I didn't have the privilege to sit in front of a budget for the school library, but I know one was non-existent. <laughs> because the school libraries across the district were sorely, sorely underfunded. There's a lack of um, investment and allocation in school libraries and the, and the current existing status of the library. And it's not to, in, in any way to make uh, a negative light with CE Rosa Schools collection. 
but I will take that as a very prime specific example of what happens when you don't value a collection or an existing school library uh, program. Things like that, I'm gonna have to question about ESSA funding of whether those funds are gonna be reallocated or not. If a budget, if I were to sit in front of a budget and kind of assess the needs of the district, particularly within my, within my realm, right. Why aren't we getting the resources and the act and right. the advocacy to get that in place and for I, our students? I'm terrible at cutting people off, but I feel like just to be fair, I've got to cut you off. But thank you again for your thoughtful answer. Um, the good news is uh, that you know usually when you're onboarded to a school board, one of the first things that you get to do is you know have a, a study session where you learn about budgets. Um, so <laughs> it's one of those things that if they're doing it right in the district, they're going to give you the training that you need. Um, so, Will, you're going to be last here and answer the same question. Um, I, you know, I was super grateful to, to have all the trainings because I am not necessarily a numbers person and I need a lot of handholding. So thank you for your candid answers. I appreciate it. Go ahead, Will. I, I have approximately the same estimate of my knowledge of school budgets as Ms. Chilius just said. Um, there's an there's an old joke uh, that uh, if there had been math on the LSAT, uh, no lawyers would ever get into law school. Um, you don't you don't go into law school because math is your strong suit. <laughs> uh, that being said, uh, I have had to work with budgets uh, just as the other candidates have, and I have a strong feeling of how to prioritize. Um, you know, when I was up with DNA People's Legal Services and Flagstaff, um, the turnover rate was extremely high up there, um, which is something that reminds me of the attrition that we're experiencing with teachers at the TUSD. Um, you know, and the, the, the issue was never burnout. The issue was, or I'm sorry, the issue was burnout. The issue was never passion. Uh, you know, the, the ability of the organization to um, support its attorneys and its staff uh, was way below the amount of emotional and intellectual labor that went into the job. Um, and so, you know, I know from that experience, especially because it was so high turnover, I was promoted very quickly. I became a uh, managing attorney of the Flagstaff office after about three or four years there. I became the senior Arizona attorney after about five years of practice, if you can imagine that. Um, and what I learned was um, in lean times, uh, organizations cut pay and benefits where they can. And um, if the funds ever come back, they don't necessarily go back into the pay and the benefits that were cut. And that has a very burdensome effect on the employees and the staff. Um, you know, I've I've been involved in some grant writing. I was uh, in charge of our housing program at DNA uh, when I was with the uh, Pasquayaki Public Defender's Office. I, was, uh, I did a little bit of grant writing, um, but we need to make sure that we're prioritizing the right things, and that's teachers, classrooms, and emotional support for students. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have still a couple more questions. I think this is a great question too. Uh, again, coming from anonymous attendee, uh, can can you describe any differences between yourself and the other candidates? It seems that you all agree on many things. I agree with anonymous attendee, um, but we can only elect two of you. So, how would you um, describe the difference between you and uh, you know the other candidates who are here and who are not here? And I'm sorry, that means this time we're gonna go with Brianna. Why Why should, and this kind of actually is actually, you know what? This is kind of like the last question that I have because I, I asked for folks to close and to say, why should we vote for you over the others? So you know what, anonymous attendee, I'm gonna hold off on this one, okay? Uh, because this is really our closing question. It, it'll give you an opportunity here in just a few minutes to be able to describe why you are the right choice. Because clearly, Tucson Unified is very lucky to have so many qualified candidates. So Brianna, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next question from our anonymous attendee. Not sure if it's the same person. It says, all of the current board members are parents and their children attend TUSD schools. Do you have school-age children and do they attend TUSD schools? 
not sure that having children makes you a qualified board member. However, this is the question. So do you have school age children? Do they attend TUSD schools? Well, first of all, thank you so much for this question. Um, I do not have any children of my own. I do not have any children that are in TUSD, but that should not eliminate my perspective on things. I feel as though my I don't think it should matter whether I have children or whether or not, excuse me, let me be uh, neutral in my language, uh, any qualified candidate who is driven with passion and who wants to make meaningful changes, it should, that should not have any barrier, no pun intended, on whether or not they have children in the district or not. I felt the need to run, um, and I'll say a little bit of this um, towards the, the other question, um, I felt the need to run because uh, speaking as a concerned community member, as well as a former TUSD employee who worked in a library specifically, um, I felt the need to do something for my kids. Now notice that you heard me say my kids, <laughs> not biological children, but I do refer to the students at CE Rose who will forever have a place in my heart as my kids. I did a lot for my kids as their school library assistant, and they are the reason why I'm running. I offer just as much perspective and experience as the next person. I don't think that has any bearing on whether or not I have kids or if that should, if I should get extra points for that. But I do bring a unique perspective of just not having children in a district, but if I did, I would see just as much as the next person, very problematic issues that I would like addressed. And if elected as a board member, I would like to see these items addressed, whether or not they, those, the solutions to the issues would directly or indirectly impact the kids. Regardless, all of the kids, especially the kids that I worked with at CEOs, Rose will, will, are and will always and forever will be my kids. I, I I share your sentiment. I I have thousands of kids at this point in my life. <laughs> um, okay, so next we are going to go to Will. Same question goes to you. All the current school board members are parents and their children attend schools. Do you have school age children and do they attend TUSD schools? Uh, Will, you are muted, so go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Sam Hughes in TUSD. She's in first grade uh, and she's great. She's got a lot of energy. Uh, my uh, younger kid uh, is uh, a year old, um, so she's, she's not attending TUSD schools yet. Um, so I'll use this uh, question as an excuse to talk about something that I meant to talk about earlier uh, when you asked about our um, policies and programs, uh, and I just somehow totally blanked on. Um, which is the fact that the federal government has stopped funding the free school lunch program that we had last year. And I know that that program was really useful to a lot of students and to a lot of parents. Um, you know, I've noticed uh, for my kid that she really enjoyed um, being able to order lunch, you know, whenever she needed to. Of course, my family, you know, we, we can afford to pay for school lunches, but there are families out there um, that can't. And I know a lot of our schools have free school lunch programs still, but some of the schools um, don't. And I believe that we should look for a way to make school lunches free for all kids. I don't think any child at any school can be expected to learn on an empty stomach. Um, so I want to make sure that kids aren't getting some kind of alternative meal because they, their parents aren't paid up on their school lunch debt. Uh, I feel like that's going to create stratification in the lunchroom and it's going to create a big stigma on certain kids. Um, so I, I, I would really like to support uh, our, our, our kids in schools in that way. Great. Thank you for that. And uh, finally, Rebecca, uh, same question goes to you. Do you have school aged children and do they attend to USD schools? Um, Hats off to you, Brianna. I, I think your your answer was great. I do think that it doesn't matter whether we happen to have kids or not in the district. 
um, because we are in shared community. Um, that being said, I, I do happen to be a parent. I do happen to have kids in TUSD. Um, and as a person who navigates TUSD for my paid work, um, I get to see both sides of um, how things work within TUSD. And what I've learned in this process as a parent of kids who are in TUSD, as a person who comes to the table with lots of resources of how to navigate such a huge district, I can um, relate to a lot of the stories that I hear from substitute teachers to current teachers, to families, to youth who are being served by the district that it's really, really hard to navigate. And as a person who does that every day, um, for it to be hard for me to advocate for my own kids um, says a lot about how um, we can do better for the community that we're serving. Um, I think TUSD has a lot of great things going for it. I'd like to see all of these come to fruition to make it even better. Um, like better resource schools that include things like the free lunch program that we'll talk about, better resource libraries, better resource schools and the sake of like school counselors and so on that aren't taking the place of things like police, um, but actually there to serve um, our kids. Um, I'd like to see things like the return of site councils, which as a parent when I first started had a really great voice in the decision-making process throughout the district, not just at the school. Um, so yes, I happen to be a parent of TUSC kids. Great, okay. So that was the last of our uh, uh, attendees questions. I don't see anything over here in the Facebook chat either. So this actually, you know, part of my role with Secular AZ is to track legislation. And I think that this is a really great question. Uh, and so this time we will be starting with Will. Uh, and the question uh, is, is this. Uh, so this, I'll preface it. This past legislative session saw a number of education slash school focused bills become law. Which bill gave you the most concern and how will you handle its implementation as a board member? So bills that have been signed into law or voted into law um, that you, uh, you know, that you have concern with, how would you handle its implementation as a board member? And Will, you're going to go ahead and go first. Um, the one that, that most concerned me um, was what I've generally heard uh, described as the universal voucher expansion. Now, somebody on Twitter earlier was arguing with me that it, it isn't a voucher. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the big difference is, but basically this would expand these um, scholarships from the state uh, to, allow, um, to allow parents to send their kids to charter schools, to private schools, um, basically with public tax dollars. Uh, any kid anywhere could, could use this um, and, and I know that people talk a lot about school choice, but what I see is a deliberate attempt to undermine public education. I've lived in Arizona since I was born, and for as long as I can remember, I have seen the state trying to undermine public education. They saddle the schools with an enormous number of ridiculous standardized tests. They cut funding to the budgets every year that they can. And now they look around and they say, oh, hey, these public schools are failing um, and we should do something about that. And instead of, you know, properly funding them, they just want to funnel all the money away to private schools. It's a con. It's a grift. Um, what I'm doing right now is I'm collecting signatures to do a ballot referendum to try to stop this ridiculous program. Um, but what I would do as a school board member, as I said, when uh, when we started out was, I want to make sure that the money that we do get goes to the most important places. I want to make sure our teachers are supported. I want to make sure that our children have mental health professionals that they need. I want to make sure that we have enough buses. I want to make sure that we have enough school books. Um, and we're going to have to really prioritize if all this money is going to be funneled away. We're also going to work, have to work much harder on student retention. 
Um, so I think that those are how I would deal with that as a school board member. Sorry, but I apologize. I was not. I was looking at this screen, not that screen. Uh, okay, so same question now is going to go to Rebecca of the bills, and there were a lot uh, that were really hyper focused on education and schools and school districts. Uh, which one caused you the most concern, and how would you handle its implementation as a board member? Um, well, I'm having a really hard time picking just one. As you said, there's just been an enormous amount of them. I think the school voucher bill is a huge concerning one. And it's obviously not the first and last draft that we'll see of it. Um, I think any of the bills that came through talking about um, how we have to teach specific types of history that aren't actually based on anything that is uh, necessarily truthful. Um, all the legislation that has come forward for uh, that's targeting trans students specifically is really dangerous. Um, so I think in all of those bills, with the exception of maybe the voucher bill, because that's sort of a bigger issue that has to be addressed differently. But I think any kind of bill that comes through that is that is signed into law that has to do with limiting curriculum based on things that aren't truths, um, on harming and erasing our uh, the children and youth that we um, serve, um, that the district has the power and the board has the power to support the superintendent and not allowing it into their schools. I mean, by volume to USD is the, I think one of two of the largest districts in the state, one of the largest in the country. Um, by nature, I think that if we begin to push back and resist certain types of policies like that, that we're able to actually effectively change and other districts might join us. We saw examples of like that, of that when um, TUSD decided not to let customs agents into their schools. This is no different. Um, and I think that is one way that the school board can really support a superintendent and it, a community that it serves more importantly. Great, thank you so much. And Brianna, uh, same question goes to you, all the bills. Uh, which one gave you the most concern and how would you handle its implementation as a board member? So I would look at my, thank you for the question. I would look at the, um, I usually follow credible entities such as the Arizona Library Association, which I happen to be a member of, and they keep track of the, uh, there's a focus group, the state legislative groups, and they keep track of applicable house bills that would affect the, the broad communities that has an effect or direct impact on like school library or like just libraries and literacy in general. Um, I happen to be a member of, of, of the, I can't say the acronym, but the association, the American Association of School Libraries, school library, school librarians and media specialists um, that spans all schools, public, private. Um, I would say House Bill 2439. And basically it just touches upon school review, uh, just review of like certain school libraries that will allow certain materials in their library. This touches upon privacy acts, uh, granting parents or caregivers access to what their children are checking out. I would say, depending on like status of the existing library programs across TUSD, it's not looking good. There's a very specific nuance within that bill, and it's and I'm not trying not to mix it up with another bill, um, but basically there needs to be a trained school librarian or school library media specialist on site that can conduct collection development review of like what age appropriate titles or applicable materials are allowed within the collection. The caveat is, if there isn't a librarian on site or employed a certified full-time school media librarian, which over 80% of the district does not. <laughs> it's just school library assistants that are employed. They don't have the applicable training to do this. The parental review kind of comes into play. That is very detrimental in allowing what books our children need access to. 
So as a school governing board, I would really work on remedying that, that issue and coming up with a solution to remedy that issue. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I do have some more questions um, I could ask. Uh, let me see. I think that many of these have been asked and answered though. Um, so I'm actually just gonna go ahead and uh, let you all have an opportunity for this one. We're gonna have three minutes. Uh, and it looks like we are going to be starting with Rebecca first. And as the anonymous attendee pointed out earlier, you all do seem to have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, crossover with the policies and the programming and the ideologies. So how, with so many very qualified cam candidates, obviously, you know, what, what makes you the best choice? And again, you can bring up the other candidates if you want to, but let's just talk about really like, why should the people in Tucson Unified School District vote for you over all these amazing candidates that are uh, clearly running and stepping up to be public servants? So uh, Rebecca, you go ahead and go first. Um, this is a great question to close out with. Um, I mean, I think what makes me sort of an outlier with the six candidates is that I'm the only person who is an educator and works with educators and currently works in TUSD. Um, and I think that brings a perspective to the board that is very different. I think it's really great that all the parent, all the TUSD board members are also parents because um, that is really important to represent on the school board level. And I also think about how um, particularly um, as Arizona is in this really critical place where we've seen since Red for Ed, where we were able to do something like go on strike and advocate for the profession and everybody who works in it. Um, I think the, the voice of an educator and a person who works with educators is missing on the board. And so I bring that to the table. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. And then uh, next we're gonna go to Brianna. So of all these wonderful candidates, why should the people in Tucson Unified choose you? So I would say that I am not a parent. I feel like that's the only difference between me and the other candidates. As I mentioned before, that should not eliminate my perspective or my take needed to bring meaningful change to the board servicing our students. I am very privileged to serve in another capacity. I feel as though being a parent does, I'm gonna say candidly, has its advantages. As Ms. Zapian pointed out, there are, it's, it's, it's multi-dimensional almost. You are working intimately with the teachers, but then also you have a relationship with a student who happens to be your child, and then you get to learn about what's really going on within your child's education. There's already an investment as well as you're already investing within your career. However, there are other members who are invested in so many different unique ways and they don't have to be a parent in order to serve on the board to give certain perspectives. I am already a public servant. I'm a children's librarian. So I already understand the importance, the importance of child development and how interconnected is that early childhood education element and having and building relationship with our caregivers within the public librarianship realm, how that will be really fruitful within my, within my way to kind of service the community. I already work with our school communities, including TUSD. And I happen to have been a former school library assistant. So I feel as though I have the perspective needed to really bring about meaningful change. And also, I am a BIPOC person. I am one of two Black librarians out of a 569 employee system within the Pima County Public Library. I, with, with, as Ms. Zapian had pointed out, I am also that as well. Since Ms. Gloria Copeland and another board member who is a person of color, I would be a diverse voice adding to really important decision makings that have otherwise right. excluded or left out those voices. So that's why I'm running for those reasons and to really improve and re really truly reflect the reality as well as the voices within TUSD on the board. 
Right. Thank you so much. I need to I need to channel my inner Ted Simons from uh, Arizona Horizon so that I can be better at cutting people off because like it's so hard because you all are saying things that are really important and I'm I'm terrible at interrupting people. Um, so I apologize. I want to make sure everybody has fair uh, representation. And uh, so that means that Will, you're going to well, first of all, before I get to you, Will, um, I want all of you, if you have social media handles, uh, websites, anything, please go ahead and put them in the chat so people can support you. You know, these are volunteer public service uh, positions. School board members do not get paid. Um, it is a labor of love. And so if you want to show your love to these school board candidates, I'm sure that they would be happy to receive it in the form of time, talent, and treasure. So hand over all of those things. You all go ahead and put them in there. We'll make sure that we copy and paste them into our Facebook. Uh, and I already put Jennifer's up there because again, I feel absolutely terrible that I made that mistake. And so uh, go ahead, share that information. We'll be sure to share it. And we'll go ahead and tell us why over all these wonderful candidates, uh, the folks in Tucson Unified should choose you. We share to hosts and panelists. So I've, I've put my Facebook information up there. Website's under construction. It'll be up pretty soon. Um, <clears throat> but uh, why should you vote for me? I think what I bring to the, to the table um, that is unique from the other uh, candidates running is my experience uh, as an attorney, um, first as a legal aid attorney and then as a public defender. I've been spending my entire professional career fighting for people who are living at or below the poverty line. Um, and it's taught me a lot about not giving up, about not um, you know, stopping just because something looks like a lost fight. Um, it's taught me a lot of empathy about um, people that have real struggles in life. Uh, and it's also, it also means that when the board does have some sort of a legal issue that comes up, I know that the board has its own legal counsel, but I believe it will be useful to have an attorney on the board to help um, guide the board through some of this legal stuff. Um, you know, I have represented a lot of clients that are uh, constantly calling me. You know, I often have 40, 50 cases at any given time. And um, what, what people don't always tend to understand is that for each individual client, their only case is their own. Um, you know, sometimes they might have three or four cases pending at a time, but their only client is themselves. I've got 50 clients. If I am on the school board, my focus is going to be on the school board. Um, the school board's council is, is going to have other people that they're dealing with. Um, and so I'll be able to bring a unique perspective in that way. Great. Thank you so much. And again, uh, Eric, I don't know if you can cue it right now, but we do have some great events coming up. It looks like our last uh, school board forum is going to be with Mesa Public Schools, which I believe is the, I think Mesa Public Schools might be the largest and Tucson Unified is second or vice versa. But um, we're, we're, we're ending it with some of our largest districts. Um, beyond that, what we're going to start doing actually, we have started inviting uh, some of our statewide candidates. Uh, and I already have confirmation that on, I think it's Wednesday, September 28th, we have invited both Kathy Hoffman and Tom Horn to come and discuss their vision for public education in Arizona. We're working on confirmation with the treasurer's position uh, with Martin Quesada and uh, Kimberly Yi. We also have, uh, what are the other candidates? We've got Adrian Fontes and uh, Mark Fincham. So as we start coordinating those before the November election, we will be sure to share those. I know that this Friday, and again, Eric, if you are able to share your screen, that would be great. Uh, but we do have some uh, great programming coming up. And if you haven't seen uh, some of our wonderful programming, I encourage you to do that. I'm gonna go ahead and share our uh, YouTube channel where you can catch up if you want to see our um, 
candidate forums or our speaker series that have been happening. I'm going to share it in our Facebook. I'm going to share it over here. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for all of you. First of all, it is, like I said, a labor of love to um, put yourself out there, especially in this climate. We've seen some pretty horrible attacks happening at our school board meetings. We've seen some pretty radical extremists stepping up to run themselves. And so the fact that you all care enough about your community to uh, run for office, put yourself out there for a volunteer position that doesn't really pay anything except for, I used to call them with my students, I, I would say you get this many hard points. And it was cute because as middle schoolers and high schoolers, they'd be like, how many hard points? was that Miss Castine? And I would be like, it's a million, you get a million today. So thank you for, um, you know, sharing that part of yourselves. Your passion is very clear. I appreciate all of you. And to everybody else, I hope they have a great rest of your week. And we hope to see you on Friday where we will have, let me see, who is the speaker that we're going to be having on Friday? Real quick. Aha, we have... Uh, Voter Choice Arizona. This is very exciting because it's a nonpartisan group working to bring ranked choice voting to Arizona. We saw, or you know, Alaska has that kind of um, opportunity for people to be able to rank their choice. On Friday, September 2nd, we have Laura Partundo, who is a fellow with the Program for the Study of Reprodu Reproductive Justice at Yale Law School, and she's going to be discussing the intersection of First and Fourteenth Amendment rights with respect to reproductive rights. Uh, we've got a great a uh, legal series coming up with a local attorney fixing the framers' failures, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments in America's New Birth of Freedom. So I hope that all of you will sign up to these various events and join us. And again, uh, we are a nonprofit organization, so your time, talent, and treasure also mean a lot to nonprofits like us. So thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight, and I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Take care. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. Of course. Thank you so much.